We're live. Dang. Okay, Small Axe Talks. I guess this is episode seven. I'm here with Michael. Thank you, sir, for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah, man. So I want to, uh, I guess, first talk about kind of like a little bit of your background and just, I know you're you're from California, right? Well, yeah, originally I was born in uh, D.C. and oh, really? okay. lived in Virginia until I was 15, but moved out to Northern California. So I consider myself a California boy after that long. So uh, okay. you know, I just turned 55. So that basically is like 40 years in California. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So That's what was that like when you moved there when you were a child? You know, it was a big deal because I was uh, 15 mm. and, you know, just started high school, freshman year completed it was a, it was hard to really? move because you just had entrenchment with kind of lots of friends that you'd known for years. Some of them you'd gone to grade school with, and then to move all the way out to the West Coast. The good thing is, I had cousins in Northern California. So my mom, the reason we moved out, she had almost gotten into an accident in the snow, and she said, "No more winters in in Virginia and and DC." And so we moved out. Wow! Holy shit! <laughs> yeah. So we moved out because she almost got an accident. And she said, "I'm done." And so we we went out to be with my aunt and cousins, and so it was uh, nice to join them in Northern California. And so I had some people I knew, and hmm, got to okay. join in some youth groups and kind of blended in. And so, yeah. But for a while. I kept wanting to go back and my mom had said, well, all right, give it, you know, three, four months. If you really want to move back after that, then I'll send you home. I'll send you home. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I don't know who the hell I'd go with because yeah. uh, I was like, where would I go? But my, uh, you know, my cousins and everything, I started blending in and it was mm. fine. You know? That's so, cool. Yeah. Where'd you go to high school? Where was the high school? In, well, in, in Virginia, the one year was Annandale High School. And it was funny because it was their 25th anniversary okay. and the football team was national champions wow then when i moved to northern california it was with a school called hillsdale high school in san mateo and it was their 25th anniversary so it was kind of oh, funky wow. to kind of join right into the school 25th and 25th year and they had an, <laughs> they had a top state champion for their football year i was like hey maybe i'm good luck i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah did you play sports? Not really. Yeah. I, you know, I tried uh, uh, a little bit in uh, football when I was a really young kid. You know, mm. even in Virginia, and I just suck at sports. Really? So I decided to go everywhere else but sports. So mm, yeah. okay, yeah, in the mind. Yeah, no doubt. Brain no power. Doubt. Started to do kind of business things and yeah. just yeah, figured I must. So when you got out of high school, uh, what what were your kind of what was your where was your head and where, where did you go like out of high school? Well, I had always thought I wanted to do medicine. Really? Be a cardiovascular surgeon. Holy shit. Oh. So, yeah. So I uh, had applied to UCLA, UC San Diego, and some other schools and got into UC San Diego, which had a great pre med program and um, went there for two years. And I started interviewing interns and, and doctors and saying, mm. so. Now that you're in it, what do you think about it? And I was surprised how many people said, I don't think I would do it again. I think Oof. medicine's going to become socialized. I'm burnt out. And they're like in their early 30s. And I'm thinking, wow, well, maybe that's not what I want to do. So I rethought it. And I love San Diego because I, I, I didn't really want to leave there. So I said, well, what can I do? And I decided to go into business and went to San Diego State and finished a degree in finance there. So Okay. Yeah. So how did you end up in, I guess, <clears throat> the, the industry that you're working now, would you call it real estate or property yeah, management? Yeah, property management. Um, so my stepfather was a, a real estate broker, and my mother had been in commercial property management with Lincoln Property Company. Okay. And so I had a little bit of a feel for it, and so I didn't know what I was going to do because... All through high school and college, I worked in the grocery business. I okay. did, you know, everything from bagging groceries to checking to, you know, then worked in produce. And so uh, my stepfather said, hey, this broker needs someone to help him to kind of get mm -hmm. him organized, help with escrows. And so I went to work for this uh, broker, <clears throat> excuse me, and he... Uh, I helped him a lot and we started dealing with a deal in San Jose before San Jose had like anything in downtown. It was nothing. Really? And we were working on a building that actually fell out of escrow, but the company that we were working to, to buy it from said, Hey, really liked working with you. Seemed like a good mm -hmm. young kid, diligent, you know, you ever thought about property management? 
And I said, well, I don't know how much, how much does it pay? Cause at yeah. that time, you know, the broker was writing me a check for a thousand dollars a month. That's all I was making. And I was oh, barely okay. making it by. And, um, so I said, well, I, I think it's upwards of maybe max is out at $2,000 a month. I'm like, boom, yes, I am a property manager. Yeah. I'm going to go do that and uh, join that company. And it's been, you know, 33 years or so in wow. property management. Yeah, that's great. So has, in, in your opinion, has that industry like grown pretty enormously? You know, it really that? has. If you think about the amount of growth in real estate development. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm in multifamily, so all apartments, but even in other forms of real estate, so much has been built and, and some, you'll have some that gets destroyed because it's older and they'll tear it down, but then they build more. Mm -hmm. So the net growth has been substantial. So mm -hmm. you have to have people that know how to manage the buildings. And I've been active in an industry group called the uh, Institute of Real Estate Management. And uh, I'm on their national board now, but that has been one that really kind of educates people about property management and the value of that. And there are a number of universities mm. now like Virginia Tech and Ball State and uh, they have a program to give a degree actually in property management, really? which has really uh, been helpful, I think, between that and some of the trade organizations uh, to grow the education aspect of it and, and allowing people to realize what a viable career path property management is because hmm. it's relatively um, recession proof because yeah. there's only so much contraction you can have where you have a number of buildings and people. You, you, you have to have people managing the buildings. Yeah. You can't go without it. So where other people would get all laid off, it's very few layoffs happen in my industry. Hmm. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah. where do you see, like, do you see that industry continuing to grow in a major way? Because I know, like, we talked about this a little bit. And just as, like, a young person, like, I feel like this is an interesting thing. And it might be for, like, other young people. It's just, mm -hmm. like, how how can you get into, uh, like, the housing market? Or how can you, like, where do you see even not just, you know, apartments and, you know, uh, multifamily housing, but even, like, uh, buying ownership housing? Where do you see that like, going in the future? Well, uh, the home ownership percentages actually had popped up a little bit when interest rates dropped even further and recently came back down again. So it's mm -hmm. like, I think it's like 63.5%, which is kind of a hovered at an all time low ownership, home ownership. And mostly for a couple of reasons. People that are older are starting to say, you know, the reality is the home owns you rather than you owning the home because yeah. of all the upkeep and things that you have to do. And it takes a lot of time and everyone wants a pride of ownership, but they're tired of working for it or mm. paying a lot to have someone do it so that it can be in, in show ready mode for guests and such. And so that group, kind of the baby boomer group is starting to sell their homes or rent them out and go out and Definitely go into size. the rental market. And the millennial group and you know Gen Zs that are just now coming into a rental age are wanting the flexibility of being able mm. to move wherever they want to work and do whatever they've wanted. So renting is a renter by choice now. Yeah. So you're seeing less people doing homes. Now, there's some groups that are doing buying homes in bulk and trying to rent them out. And that's a growth area for, for some folks. But as far as the, the, the ownership aspect, there's... A, what I've done work for is a real estate investment trust, which is a way to own real estate, be it multifamily or any other type of real estate, mm. where you basically have a stock ownership in the real estate. So the company buys it and then sells stock, and that's behind the ownership entity. So you can, as an investor, own shares of real estate. So if you, I was with a company called Camden Property Trust. So if you still have stock, you could say, well, I own a part of all of their buildings. Yeah. In a sense, your fractional interest is your shares of stock. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So do you, do you think, like as uh, maybe our country moves more in that direction, do you think like, like you said, people that's for younger people, is that less of like the American dream? Like you have a home, and you live in that home for 50 years, and that's kind of just how it is. I think the American dream has changed considerably. Mm. I think people like the idea of ownership because it feels nice to say I own this home, and they're still at this time, which there's talk about changing that, the benefits of ownership being that 
if you get a fixed rate, for instance, you can lock in what your payment is for 30 years. So there, you know what it's going to be rather than in the rental market, your rent can go up as the markets yeah, uh, change. So there's that aspect. And there's also the tax advantage where you can deduct the interest on mm. your loan. So you're sort of paying yourself as you go each moment. Yeah. So there's a benefit to that. That may change, though. They've talked about changing that so that the government obviously can have more to fund all the programs they have. And if that goes away, what will happen short term, you're going to see this massive adjustment. All of a sudden, all of the property values will take a huge dump. Hmm. Uh, and then everything will regulate and kind of you know, equal out. But yeah. at first, that will change it. But nevertheless, I think the, the American dream is very different and, yeah. and, and, than it used to be. Well, it's so weird because like I look on Zillow, Zillow all the time mm -hmm. and uh, there's like an area here in Arizona called Arcadia and there's a lot of really cool like old 50s like brick homes and like, right. they're so badass. And like even if you look in the early 2000s, I mean, they were selling for like a quarter of the price that they're trying to sell them for now. So it's like right. that's what I don't and I think a lot of other people don't understand is it's like, it's like the growth can't be like infinite. So it's like at some point you would think I guess if there's a demand there for it, but it's like at some point you think there's going to have to be some sort of adjustment for the prices of housing because it's like even the sure. new stuff you see building now, like the homes, like a lot of them, I mean, they look like they're built out of like fucking plywood. Like it's like yeah, the brick homes were so badass and they lasted, you know, how there's, long. There's a lot of benefit uh, that people do see in in, in that, that home ownership aspect, but you know, mm. there's still population growth. Yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. still a fair amount of uh, younger folks that are living with their family still. That yeah. There's a lot of what we've called pent-up demand, right? So at some mm. point, yeah, the parents are going to say, get the hell out of the house. Yeah, I'm yeah. done with you. I'd like to have my own time now. Or, you know, the folks, the kids that have been living at home are going to say, you know what? I'm tired of living with mom and dad. I'd kind of like to do my own thing. And maybe they'll cohabitate with others and buy a home together. There's a lot mm -hmm. of different ways to do it. But so there's still this demand. So at the end of the day, be it for rental or for buying a home, yeah, yeah. there's still the demand. So so there's a lot of that hasn't been met yet hmm. that when they finally decide to move out, they will. And then they'll do one of those two things. Uh, and just as populations grow, the, the population growth has slowed somewhat. But still, as a base of what you had, even in a slower amount, the sheer numbers of people that will be getting older into an, an age of either wanting to buy or rent hmm. is is ever present it will still be there yeah yeah that's crazy yeah i didn't think about you know growing up it's like here more traditionally in this country like you want to get out when you're young and you want to like acquire your own possessions your own right. home but it's like in a lot of other countries there's like generations of families living in a home maybe or so i think here we're used to a different level of expectations towards housing towards what you want yes you know yes. you know look at other cultures so many of the families still live together uh you know grandparents and and kids till they're much further along and yeah. grandparents and the parents will live together for you know till they die and so that's crazy. our culture has been kind of built on that that desire to be out on our own and everyone kind of you know their own space um you, know, you think about so much of the way the world has changed has been moving into very individualistic. You know, we have all these things, you know, the Facebooks of the world and things like that, that I'll call it, I call it, it does the very opposite thing than what it seems like it was set out to do, right? Bringing people mm. together. But if yeah, you yeah. think about it, you know, people will post on Facebook what they want others to see, right? No one's going to yeah. post, hey, I lost my job today, or a few people will, or this went bad. And so I call it faux book in a lot of ways. Um, but what's happened is that people see what's been posted and they're like, oh, I know what's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. We may not talk. And so what happens is that in the very thing that supposedly bring you closer together, it's like you don't call grandma as much, right? Because, well, grandma's posted that, you know, she and grandpa are going out dancing and we know what they're doing. Yeah. So what's happening is there's that less connectivity, I think, than before. And so mm. people are just getting more and more spread out. People want what I call the middle of the brownie. They the want, the they, they, you know, the sweet spot, right? Yeah, they, yeah. they only want what they want for as long as they want. Mm. And, and they'll be willing to pay a premium. Mm. But just, I just want that middle piece in the middle of the brownie pan. That's yeah. all I want. So everyone else can have all this other stuff. But so, you know, 
that's the way the world's been going. So, Very so what do you what do you think about like like let's say fifty years from now? Because obviously, like more people work remotely now. You can work on your computer. You can work from yeah. home. So do you think cities will become less populated? And you think people, like you said, will spread out more, and people will want to have more room? Not necessarily. The mm-hmm. interesting thing about that is that if you think about all these people that want to have their individualism, right, and they mm-hmm. don't, they don't see each other as as much but yet you have these things like the we work and the growth of the coffee houses right i mean Mm -hmm. you you love to go to the coffee houses but some of it's just because i like being in the same room with people i may not be talking to them but it's just kind of knowing that they're there gives you a sense of comfort that you're with people Hmm. it's odd for me because i'm like i want to start conversations and talking to people but People are comfortable with just being in the same space and not necessarily talking to mm. them. They might be on their their iPads or what have you, doing their own thing. But if they wanted to have a conversation, I guess they could. So what I'm getting to is that I think these micro units, smaller units uh, for like, for instance, rental or even ownership in the cities, the density that needs to be there. I think people like having people around mm. With the option to talk to them, yeah, yeah, although they may not choose to talk to them all that much. That's interesting. Yeah. I definitely see that, yeah, because when I walk into a lot of coffee shops, it's like a sea of people on their laptops. Right. No one's talking to each other, yeah, or yeah. very few, yeah, yeah. but they like being there because they can kind of hear what's going on. The The fact that they're around gives a sense of comfort. Yeah. That's being together. It's an odd. Have you noticed like a difference since since you were like younger compared to like now with all of the technology and things that are going on with how people like interact, is there like a notice noticeable difference or not really? You know, I came from the East coast mm-hmm. and the East coast mentality is still much more about family because I, I manage properties in Virginia and South Carolina. And so when you go out and talk to those folks and in Tennessee, the family unit is much tighter than it is out here. The further mm. west you tend to go, the more liberal and the more, uh, at least this is what I've seen in my, yeah, own, yeah. my own example, is that the people are, are less in touch with one another. Mm. So your relationships when you're in the east and midwest tend to be uh, maybe fewer, but much longer lasting and deeper. Mm. Here and in the west is you might have more kind of contacts and associations with people and less deep relationships this is what i found so you can say oh my gosh here's my facebook i have you know a thousand friends no you don't you don't have a thousand friends you have probably five that that you might be able to say they're really close the rest are just people yeah they think they know you because of what you post Mm. yeah Yeah. that's not good i I, the quality has dropped and Mm. i think in the name of again that individualism of getting the small piece of pie when I want it for as long as I want it. I only want, you know, you don't have to buy the album anymore, right? You, you, I only want the one song on the album. The old yeah. days, you have to buy the album. Well, you know, when iTunes came out, I could buy the one song I want. That's all I need. Yeah. I'll pay more on a per song basis than I would if I bought the album, but hmm. I just want that song. Yeah. So it's kind of that same trend, I think, that so much of life has taken. It's just micro units of things that they buy, use, and want. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you think that's like uh, social media and like all the instant gratification stuff? Do you think that's why people are um, like, it seems like today people are like, they're so agitated all the time. And I was thinking like, maybe that could be possibly a reason why is it's like, they're not like, we don't want to wait for, to like get to a certain place or like achieve something. We like, you know what I'm saying? I definitely see that. And it, it, I used to joke around, call it the the Miller High Life beer commercial sensation, right? So, and by that I mean it's like when I was younger. So the idea before all the social media was out, you'd go and see all these commercials, right? Hmm. And so I remember there's like a Miller commercial, and it's this bar, and everyone's good looking, and having a great time. They show up in the bar, life's good, and you're like, I I want that. How do I get that? You know, yeah. I'm like I gotta beer stomach i'm eating i'm taking beer but i don't look like these people and like so you want that thing and so Mm. when i talk about like phobic and and uh you you look at the uh, twitter and and Mm. instagram and and people post all these cool things right so what you're Mm. seeing is all this cool stuff even the advertisements the cool gadgets and the newest this 
And so that's what you're fed constantly that you're scanning through, right? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Look at these new sneakers. Look at these whatever. So we've become this society that wants that instant gratification, the newest, the greatest, and we're consumaholics. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm guilty of that, right? Yeah. So I'm here visiting, you know, your dad and hanging out and I... You know, I went to the Fashion Square, bought some stuff at my yeah. Tommy Bahama store and Ted Baker, and I, I love that stuff. And I'm like, look at myself. I am just as guilty of it, but I'm, yeah. I'm at least conscious of the fact that yeah. consumerism is probably higher than it ever was. Mm. And so it kind of makes you wonder, again, that, that sensate culture. Do you think that'll go down in the future? Like people, because I, like for me, I don't know, but I can't speak for everybody, but like for me, like I try to buy things that are as high as quality as possible. And I try yeah. to keep it for as long as possible. So it's like, do you, do you think people are going to be forced to do that? Or do you think people... Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think you're an anomaly because, yeah. uh, in part because of, because of your dad and, and the way he, yeah. he views the world. He's less a consumer than I am. And we joke around that, that, that difference. Um, it could go one of a couple of ways. And, it's, and I'm still... Jury's out in my mind as far as, you know, does it... He, you could make a comparison to biblical time, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You know, the, the society that just went, you know, crazy into sensate and sex and all that stuff. And so, and then, you know, boom, you know, you get Moses and you, or you get the ark and, and, you know, God washes everything out and yeah. then, you know, levels the world basically. Jesus. Um, you wonder if you get to such a place mm. that something has to break because I think, you can't vibrate that fast. You can't always want everything new and crazy without it coming to a head. Yeah. And sometimes I look at the way the United States is and that the rest of the world's looking at us like that company's fat and happy and all they're, you know, about Hollywood stars and about the most sensate thing. And that at some point they're going to say, we need to show them what life should be like. Yeah. I honestly think sometimes, you know, we'd be ripe for an invasion for people just says, oh these people God. are fat and happy and they're sitting on the sidelines and I don't think they get what's going on around the world. Yeah. Um, or if, if that's we, deep, man, I know, I know. And I, I think about that because <clears throat> it's like it's, the rest of the world's watching us. And you yeah, look no, at, you know, no. Why did ISIS get to where it was and why mm. did these things happen? How did we get 9-11? Right. Mm. I mean, I think it was a wake up call, but what happened? Right. We spent maybe, what, a year as a nation. We bound together. Neighbors were talking to neighbors. And it was like, well, we should stop today. You know, it was 18 years ago. Hmm. And it's like, do we think about it that much? Once in a while, we'll see something. And we think about it on 9-11. But it's like, it's a passing moment. We, I don't think we've learned our lesson. And so you wondered, will we get that way on our own and stop and say, hey... We got to remember the basis about what this nation was important and families yeah. and relationships. But I will say I've noticed, and maybe it's just because I feel that I've been changing. And as you get older, you start mm. to get, I don't know if you can call it more spiritual. You start looking at stuff and saying like, okay, why am I here? Why, mm. why have we gone through this life? Why have I been on the merry-go-round and I wanted to have a certain lifestyle and all these things and you're going like so when we die where does it go what do we do I mean so what really happens why are we here living this Mm. existence that we do and so as as this group of baby boomers and I think other people I've noticed more people say they've become more spiritual and that means Mm. different things for different people but you start looking at the universe and trying to seek some bigger understanding about where do we go yeah it can't just be this so if i'm preparing my way for whatever is the transition and i look at it on a on a physiological point of view i I look Mm. at you know we're energy i mean we have energy right we eat food which provides energy we you know there's something to be said that Science has shown that when we die and they put a body on a on a on a tray, so nothing mm-hmm. can be lost, right? I mean, you, when you die, you lose your sense of your bowels. So if you had anything, it's going to empty on the tray. Oof. Okay, so, so but they have looked at an infinitesimal loss of weight when hmm. a person dies, and they attribute that potentially to 
a soul or something, right? Energy, That's right? Crazy. In That's physics, crazy. I don't know whether it's entropy or enthalpy, says that energy is never lost, it just changes form, right? Mm, okay. So there has to be an energy force within each of us. I think it's kind of an encapsulated energy in our body. Mm. So if we die, it just goes out into the universe. I mean, which is full of energy, right? You look at the theory of uh, the the universe is constantly expanding. Hmm. So it all has this energy that's constantly expanding. So I always wondered, does energy just get thinner and thinner in its, crazy, in its concentration? But nevertheless, we're part of this energetic field is my belief. That's my level of spiritualism. And if you think of these parallels to things like the Bible and other religions. Hmm. And so... I call things when I sort of set my intentions, and I think I've told you stories about how I got my job at Camden and how I got this job. Yeah. It was given to other people, but I set my intentions that this is mine. And whereas your dad and my friends were saying like, okay, we need to get Michael drunk because someone else has that job. And I said, no, it's mine. So do you write things down or is this just I, in your mind? You're I, saying- I do it in my is... mind. I'll say it out loud. I'll make mm. affirmations. And things happen. I think it's uh, years ago when I watched The Secret about the law of attraction. Yeah, I've heard of it before, yeah. And I really do believe there is something to be said for that because I put my mind on things. And it's like, let's say you buy a Honda Accord. Mm. And all of a sudden you're going like, God, there's all these Honda Accords on the road. I just never realized that. It was always there. It's just now that you're looking paying for it, right? Yeah. So if you're paying attention and looking for something that you want, mm, it will show it. up. If yeah. you, you're you attracting it because you're looking for it. Mm, that's interesting. But if you're not looking for it and you think you wanted it, it'll pass you by. So, so what I was getting to is that these affirmations, some people call it prayer, right? So they pray mm -hmm. to God. I think God is the universe. And you think, well, that energy. And then I said, we turn into the universe. Well, Bible says, I am the body of Christ. Well, if Christ is the universe hmm. and all knowing and everything else, well, then yes, we're energy. We go back into the universe. We're, it's the same thing. You can call it whatever you want. It's a universal idea that we are all energy and the universe is energy and we just pass back and forth. So, do you believe in like reincarnation? Or Absolutely. Like that? Really? Absolutely. Because, I, again, I, it, the, the premise is that we're energy. And so, when a human is born at some point, I don't know what energy forms, you know, there's the physiological point of view. And then there, I believe there's a spiritual, why wouldn't we mm. all, why wouldn't we all be the same in the way we think and the way we do things yeah. physiologically, we're the same. So why wouldn't we act the same and be the same? There has to be some driving forces and things I think that cause us to be who we are and what we are and think the way we think. Hmm. That's crazy, man. Yeah, I know. It's deep, huh? I could, yeah, I could go like so many directions with this. I just want to say one thing. It's like, did you see recently um, Denver, uh, they decriminalized uh, magic mushrooms. And recently there's been, um, I think in California, I can't remember like which universities or which uh, uh, institution they're doing research on like um, more like psychedelics and stuff like that. But I just think that whole like field of study is so fascinating. Like, I don't know, you know, I, I know a little bit about it just because like all the stuff that happened with like Leary and like the seventies with LSD sure, and stuff like sure. that, that kind of like halted everything. Cause they were like, what the fuck? Like, it this it is, did. Cause it could get into control. And yeah. I think it's interesting. So you look at the John Lennon's of the world and you look at yeah. some of those folks and like Yoko Ono and it's, they're fascinating people. If you kind of study a little bit about them and I'm amazed at how many people I have met that have tried different things, hmm. be it mushrooms, be it, um, uh, God, I was trying to think of the name of some of these. There's this, I'm doing it wrong. It's not Hiawatha. Oh, ayahuasca. Ayahuasca. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, people have asked me if I want to try it. I, I've heard too many weird things. That's super popular now, it, ayahuasca. Yeah, yeah, but people are throwing up and getting a little bit crazy. Just, <laughs> oh, I, it's like, I don't, good, I don't need to be throwing up. <laughs> but, but, but some people have talked about different things that are a little bit lighter. But mm -hmm. the premise that I've heard uh, is that right now, right, we're so stuck in our brains mm. to be able to kind of relax the mind mm. and sort of let thought in and out that people are taking some of these things to relax their brain, as mm. it were, and let thought 
kind of flow in and out. Now, some people say, well, all right, is that just hallucin hallucinogenics or is it that you've able to sort of, in a sense, thin out the barrier of control of your brain so that you mm. can actually let things flow? I'm not sure. And I think I understand the idea of a drug-induced ability to just relax yourself, right? Because in a sense, we're all in control, right? We're we're controlling yeah. the way we, we do we things, or we think we are. Yeah, but yeah. but but the reality is, is you know, driving and 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 operating machinery, as I say, don't you know, mm. you are in control, right? Because you can do these things. And if you, excuse me, if you take some sort of drugs, you can't control that, right? So mm. so you're in a sense. You should be locked in a room or not going out, no keys and anything. But but then you're you're kind of free floating, and some people like that sensation. I'll mm. tell you, I, and my wisdom teeth pulled when I was sixteen, and they gave me some Percocet. Oh my god! I took one of those things, and I was floating. And I told my mom, I said, "Do not give me any more of that." Because really? I just felt like I was so out of control, and I do wow. not like to be out of control. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had some weird dream, like I remember. Oh my God. I was I was dreaming after this that I was in my bed and I was I felt that I woke up I was just waking up in time to see this black cloaked creature thing person what? injecting me with something to put me to sleep it's like I woke up and I, to see this about to put me back to sleep and I remember <gasps> I oh couldn't my God. you know they say some people you can't scream I think yeah. I understood it I was trying to scream and I freaked out and I went back to sleep. Wow. And I told my mom it was like this nightmare. And I'm like, I never want to take that thing again. Wow, that's crazy. Now, some people kind of like get off on that. Like, well, mm. this is really cool. I think I can imagine as an adult now, if there was some sort of controlled way, mm -hmm. maybe not ayahuasca, because I've just heard all too lot yeah, of yeah. stuff. People go to Peru and, yeah. and do all these things. And I know I've had a number of friends who have done that. Yeah. Rhythmia. And, that's like the big one, I think. Rhythmia. Yeah, that one I'm not familiar with. Oh, okay. But maybe it's a, a derivative. But yeah. nonetheless, it's, that's a lot of out of control. A lot of work. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I would do that. Uh, plus, you know, what I do today, you know, I... I I would not want something to happen and then I'm out of control and then there's some yeah. newsprint. Yeah. Michael Brown, you know, you know, this industry leader all of a sudden, you know, he gets, went full yogi. Yeah. Yeah. He went off the Doesn't scale. wear a shirt anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a bad That's thing. That's crazy. Yeah. So like, just like on the, like the, the spirituality and like the technology and materialism, do you mm. see people like in the future, do you see people, like, do you think people will get more spiritual and like kind of progress that way? Or do you think people will integrate more with technology and become more like materialistic, basically? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thought. I, I believe people are becoming more in tune with the spiritual sense of the world. Hmm. I think it's becoming more and more open through uh, Buddhism, uh, Taoism, hmm. uh, yoga, things that are kind of mind body continuum that that heightened sense of awareness i think is leading us into a greater sense of awareness and at the same time you have this constant growth in technology yeah. so maybe what would happen is that this hopefully it's not like an irobot movie where yeah. where the automation of things with all the mundane things of life are set in through technology so that our time can be spent more on higher sense of life and existence. Perfect, yeah. Hopefully that's the way we are able to utilize the technology because then it's less about work for work's sake or labor. Mm. It's about the ability to really understand where are we? Because what is it? They say we use, you know, 10, 15% of our brain. Yeah. And so if we're yeah. able to use, you know, look, if we went from, if it's, let's say it's 10, if we were to go from 10 to 15, we have grown by 50% yeah. of what our brain power was. Think of what we could do hmm. and understand and be enlightened with if we were able to increase it. Yeah. Well, that's what, have you, do you know who uh, Andrew Yang is? Have you heard of that dude? I don't. Okay. So he's a guy running for uh, president at the moment. Or is in, he really? Yeah. Yeah. So he's, okay. um, I first heard As about him on Rogan. Of sorts, or? Yeah. 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 I heard, uh, no, I think. Well, actually, I'm not 100% sure. I think he might be independent, but he's like in his mid 40s, maybe mid to late 40s. And I first saw him on Rogan, and um, okay. 
he's like been involved in the tech industry for his whole career and he's been an entrepreneur and basically like the the thing I'd be interested to get your perspective on because the main like idea he's running on is universal basic income and what he says is mm. he's like I used to think that entrepreneurs could change the world and they could create the jobs that could employ all the people and they could create you know a functioning to society but he's like now um, I'm more along the lines of thinking that you know, because automation is going to be taking all these jobs. And he talks about like the trucking industry, for example, mm -hmm. he thinks like in the next de decade, that's all going to be, you know, uh, yeah. you know, dri driverless trucks and stuff like that. That's right. like 250,000 jobs. And he's like, basically long story short, he's like a lot of these people aren't going to be able to be retrained. Like they're going to be, you know, truckers in their fifties. They're not going to be right. like computer programmers. Right. So he's like, his platform that he's running on is he wants to give every American a thousand bucks a month. And he's like, basically that's just to keep things from shit hitting the fan. And, well, it's know. like, but I'd be interested to get your perspective on this because it's like, I do like politically, like it's so confusing right now. And like I did this past election, like I liked people like Bernie Sanders because they talk about, you know, Medicare for all. And they, and it like, in my opinion, like, Anything that has to do with health or safety should be something that is a government program because so it's not or so it's not a for profit industry. So it's sure. an and it sure. like our military should not be privatized in my opinion because that would be sketchy. Like in my anything that has to do with health or safety that way it's functioning at an appropriate level for people and is affordable and there's not aspects of it that are taking advantage of people and sucking money out of the population. Well, so. Uh, and I think there were some statistics someone ran, like under Bernie Sanders healthcare program, the company would the company the country would be bankrupt in a mm. short order. So you think about, I mean, in the truest sense of communism, the idea, right, is that everyone lives a decent life. No one's gonna be better or worse than the other, but they're all existing together it's supposed to be peace i mean it's mm. funny as i've gotten older that john lennon song imagine right yeah, yeah, yeah. when i first heard it so oh you know it's about communism and like oh everyone's communism is horrible and i'm not for uh communism you're a communist right? yeah right yeah yeah it's, it's just perfect um but you think about that is that as i've gotten older and that the sense the imagery of if mm. everyone was living in peace the globe was in peace and everyone was just thriving and able to enjoy life and families and things like that that's kind of a bit of a nirvana right yeah, but yeah, a lot of people would say yeah but it doesn't instill a sense of drive to improve life and improve in existence and mm. so as a result we'd all still be kind of in the 50s if we stood that way what is the incentive for creating new and part of you think if that everyone got a thousand dollars or whatever it is yeah Who's earning the money with which to give that $1,000? How, how is it creating this money stack so that people can get it? Yeah. There still needs to be something that drives it. And what will drive it if everyone is sort of disincentivized to do anything? Yeah, so he explains it more thoroughly and okay. more intelligently than what yeah. I'm going to say. But okay. basically, he <laughs> says, like, it's the, the productivity is coming from a uh, some sort of a tax on the automate the automation so it's coming from the it's coming from some sort of i can't remember there's some term for it and it's used in europe and it's a yeah. it's a tax basically on the productivity of automation and there was some other piece and he had it i i don't even know i mean i i could send you like a link yeah. or people look into it if you're more interested but basically like it's like like i i think people should be rewarded if you contribute more. And I think if you are somebody like Elon Musk, or if you're somebody who is crazy, like working all the time, like you should have more, like you should have more things. Like if you want a Ferrari or like all this shit, but to me, it's like, we should like, if there was a base level of existence, that would right. be amazing. Like if, at least if people were not like, isn't that what we call off. welfare though? I mean, in other words, kind of, yeah. So people are on welfare, yeah. they're getting a stipend or, or food stamps or whatever those things are. It's, yeah. a, it's a host of different programs, but they're getting things for existence, the section eight uh, vouchers to give them a living existence. So in a sense, they're getting it and they're not necessarily working. 
and I'm not going to get into all the ins and outs yeah, about yeah. you know whether that's good or not. I mean, there should be some sort of work fair. We've tried all these different programs, and yeah. we haven't figured out the answer. And I, I, I'm concerned if you look at our our national debt, and we keep adding programs yeah, yeah. and programs and programs. It's at some point we're going to break, and and mm-hmm. China still owns the bulk of our bonds, hmm. and so in a sense they own us. And I always wondered how that works with what Trump's doing to the, trade you know, war. the trade war, and like, is, how's that going to work? I don't know enough about it, so I yeah. couldn't speak to it as intelligently. But it does make you wonder where does this level off, and does that cause a war? Where people said, screw you, you know, you're not paying it, or 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 you're trying this angle, and so you owe us this. Hmm. I'd be curious where it goes, but the the deal is, is whatever we're doing now isn't working. Yeah, yeah. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over yeah. and over again, expecting that different result. We need to do something different. Hmm. I just don't know what it is. I, I've become more liberal as I've gotten older, but I also know that we have to have a base that incentivizes people to work hard, work smarter, and to be able to generate more income. Um, but, but we're, we're inefficient in running of our don't programs. you think like if people weren't like living in fear like you said they would be like maybe in more of like that uh, not like a utopia but a setting where like people they could be more creative and they could potentially add more to society versus like crushing people sure it's and, possible and working all these mundane stupid fucking jobs that like cashiers not that i mean that's terrible but it's like these are like jobs that you're just like standing there and like, like a robot could easily right. do that you know right well uh yes and no so part mm-hmm. of you thinks about so the people that are doing it right i mean i did a, i did cashiering right all through through high school because yeah, yeah. it was it, it was a means to to pay for school and 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 mm. survive but you think about that so today's what uh, minimum wage even in some of the highest places let's say it's 15 dollars an hour i think mm-hmm. it is it's working its way till to 20 i think in la but even at twenty dollars an hour, right? Yeah, it's forty two grand a year, or whatever it is. Yeah, that's not a lot yeah, of no, money. Yeah. I don't know how people survive on that, mm. and that's where they're living with other people, or the whole family is working and living together and, and trying to. That that's really tough. Yeah, yeah. To 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 survive. So you wonder if those jobs go away because mm. you can automate it, right? There are self checkouts, and there are all those things, or or you just go, Alexa, I'm going to make fried chicken on Monday, and I'd like to make pizza on Tuesday. Alexa looks at your refrigerator, orders everything, and will have it delivered to you. Yeah. So not only did you not even necessarily have to have a cashier, you, you know, you might just have a, 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 a robot that picks it all out of the store and sends it to you and delivers to an Uber or, yeah. or, or in the future, an automatic machine or delivery system or, or drops it by a drone of some sort. Nobody's involved with that. So... Mm. With that kind of massive change in the workforce, excuse me, how much could these, what can these people do? Where is their skill set going to be coming from? Exactly, right? yeah, that's so, the question. How are they going to get educated? Who's going to pay for that education? Mm-hmm. And then what will they do with that education? And how many people do we need trying to work on new avenues of technological growth? Hmm. It's like I think you'd have this glut of people versus ability and jobs capable of supporting that. So then it becomes this state where all we're doing is massive handouts. And again, it goes back to how are that income, how will it get generated? Hmm. Who will be the generators of income? Yeah, yeah. If the whole globe becomes technologically advanced to that degree, and it would yeah. take a while for other countries like, you know, even India, who's very advanced, but, you know, 1.3 billion I know, yeah. population, and I was there, you, you still look at where, who's generating the income? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's got to do it. And if everybody's automated... Well, what do you, what do you think about things like, like Bitcoin and like cryptocurrencies? Because what if you had, let's say potentially you have half the U.S. population who has nothing to lose to go to a cryptocurrency? Right. Do you think that's like something that could happen? You know, the Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency has grown. There's like all a whole bunches of different ones. Bitcoin is the one everyone knew because they were the pioneers. Right? Yeah, yeah. But there's so many others. And like my mm. sister had said, yeah, I, I spent 600 bucks and bought it. And I think she's wow. uh, she's doubled, you know, her money. I mean, $1,200, you know, but people have made a lot of money. I, 
unfortunately, I don't understand it well enough because I'm thinking, what is the foundational basis yeah. of the value? And it seems like it could crash at any time. But there's no foundational basis to the value of dollar. There, there wasn't, right? When we went yeah. off the gold standard in Nixon's time. At, for that time, it was. But, you know, the what where the value of money comes from is that the government controls how much physical dollars mm. are in the money supply. Mm. So the, the I guess it's the Fed that controls it, I forget now, but the money supply, M1, M2, M3, that's a different money supplies, are controlled. So literally, you think of all the valuation of everything that is on the the face of the United States, real estate, services, everything else, hmm. is in a sense based upon a lot of what is the, the money supply in the United States. So inflation happens if you were to start printing more physical dollars. Hmm. Inflation happens, right? Because just because you have more of it, there's there's only so much, there's that demand there. So people will have, the same demand will be the same. They'll give you more and more dollars because there's more available. Mm. More dollars are chasing the same commodities. It's, it's a limited supplies and resources. So that's where inflation comes in. So, so the basis right now is based upon the government controls how many dollars in there to keep things at a level spot. Mm. Well, with these cryptocurrencies, I... I just don't know well enough to think like, well, what is the basis? It's like, why don't I start Michael Brown dollars? Yeah. <laughs> and let's start selling <laughs> Michael should. Brown dollars. I mean, so, <laughs> so what does that mean? I don't know. And yeah, how yeah. does it have value? I, it scares me a little bit. But yeah. somehow there's obviously a lot more and people smarter than me that, 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 that I don't know that is keeping this value alive. Mm. I, I worry about it long term. Do you know who John McAfee is? Yes. He's also running for president. He's oh, like yeah. he's like in exile in the Bahamas right now. Like <laughs> he's like posting crazy shit on Twitter and uh, but he's like a big uh, uh, Bitcoin yeah supporter. Yeah, I had heard that. Damn. Have you invested in Bitcoin? Oh hell no 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 no. I'm the same thing. It's like well the, you don't know who the founder is like. Right. You know uh, nobody knows who it is and it's like if it was something to where it's like. Apple came out with their like we have this like Apple currency and I would do so if it if it came from like a company that had some sort of a reputation I would be open to it for sure and and technically anybody could you know what I would mean it be tied to though again it what? has to be tied to but it doesn't matter I mean, I mean initially like let's say just for like shit or like giggles like Apple came out uh, you know next year with this this form of currency like I think a lot of people would you know, a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, and they would start using it just because they don't really have anything to lose. And I think right. it could become something. I think you're better off buying Apple stock. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's value there. I mean, then yeah. again, in a lot of ways, you look at stock, you know, yeah. when uh, analysis is made and they look at stocks, they're going like, okay, it's trading at a PE ratio well above what seems uh, a valuation of the company would support hmm. and so that's what happens when you get this frenzy in the stock market they start bidding up these prices in, and then you have a market crash because too many people are well they're bidding it up and I'm gonna bid up and all of a sudden this overly bid up valuations of companies get too high and people start realizing that's not the value you have a crash and you have a correction that brings it down and then everyone sort of settles in and your PE ratios start matching more realistically what hmm. um, optional uh investments would be for your dollars that's what happens in those crashes what do you think about people or what do you think about like our country and the way we we evaluate overall uh i guess not happiness but overall well-being of the country based on things like gdp or how well the stock market is doing do you think that's like a healthy practice for a society you know, there's a certain sense of ignorance is bliss. A lot yeah. of people don't pay attention to it. Um, but I think you have to pay attention to the overall health of the country in where are we financially? What is that, that happiness ratio? Are enough people able to consume and achieve a lifestyle that they believe makes them look forward to getting up every day yeah. and to 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 living are they is there that happiness factor and a lot of it it's gauged upon how much am i able to buy 
do I buy Wonder Bread or am I able to buy the $4.85 loaf of bread that tastes better, it seems like it's made from organic materials versus you know, stuff that's just, you know, high bleached, you know, flour and that, yeah, I, you could survive. You see, you see people who um, are, for, are less fortunate, uh, you know, they're living in encampments and tents and, and you would think if you're in poverty, you'd be thin, right? Because you wouldn't have much yeah. food. And what hap- <laughs> no, but what's happening is you get uh, McDonald's of the world some place that have the, you know, the meal, the 99 cent burger, right? Yeah, so yeah. if you're out panhandling or you get a, a, some government assistance, you're eating this bad food. So what's happening is these, these poor folks that don't have that, that income are hmm. eating crap. Terrible it sustains food, yeah. them for now. But if you ate, you know, hamburgers every day, mm. you're going to die early. You're going to get disease and yeah. you're, it's going to be a bad existence. It's, it's sad, but, but I think that the original question though goes back to is, should we pay attention to that? I think we have to, I think mm. you need to, because it could get out of control. It's like, you know, putting, you know, a whole bunch of suds in the washing machine, thinking that you did the yeah. right thing and then leaving. And the next thing you come back and your house is full of soap. Yeah. <laughs> you got to pay attention. Yeah, that's true. What do you think about um, things? Do you like things like uh, like home, homelessness in LA and like places like Seattle and Portland? Do you think that's on the rise? And what do you think like a possible solution I, for that is? Because it's for me, it's so weird living in a society where you could have, you know, somebody on the side of the street with nothing and they're whacked out and whatever, right. and then you could have somebody driving by in a Rolls Royce and they have like, it's so bizarre, like the contradiction of it like is. they're to- they're totally different worlds. It is, I think, um, we, there's a lot of folks that just like to like, just, just sweep them over there, sweep yeah. those people over there. And we need to do something about it. Not, you know, I'm in housing, I'm in multifamily. And so I believe we need to do something to help people mm. who are less fortunate. There are some people who are less fortunate because they've chosen that way. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know what the percentages are. And I'm, you know, far be it from me to make that judgment call. There are other people who have sickness, who have, yeah, they're unable to support themselves. And so I get it that we don't have enough programs to do something about it. And maybe, you know, that's that liberal side of me that says, we need to do something to help these people and yeah. understand that better. And does that mean we tax more and you know, if we were all taxed at the same rate in a way to help mm. folks and to do it the right way and probably not have government run it because it's usually the most inefficient means to do so, but to truly help people that need help yeah, yeah. and understand if they're just being lazy or are they really in need of help yeah. and help those people, we need to do that. Mm. And if that means in some of our cases, I know when we were looking at rent control in California. Mm. And one of the options we talked about as an industry group was, you know, maybe we, we all state that everything that gets built or everything that is built and over time segues into a certain amount of that housing is for low income housing mm. that helps to keep people integrated, but also helps them in some sort of way to have a place over their head. Mm-hmm. Let's do that. You know, the challenges you have is some people saying like, okay, so if 10% of every apartment building were set aside for what is today the homeless, you know, the, 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 the challenges are some people do have a lot of sickness and yeah. they would cause damage to themselves or others, not even intentionally. So there's, I don't want them around my children. I don't yeah. want them around this. I don't know what the answer is, but we're not doing a very mm. good job at fixing that. I think we need to spend more time, energy, and money in doing it and then figure out how to do it effectively yeah. and not just throw dollars in the places that really don't do that. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of inefficiency and the right people have their hearts in the right places and then it just gets blown away by inefficiency. Hmm. Yeah, because you look at places like San Francisco or LA or whatever, it's like you, when you have the, these large populations of homeless people, it's like yeah. most of these people, I mean, I guess you could build subsidize or low-income housing in those areas but it's like they're not going to be able to afford those areas anyway so it's like what's well what's so some people point? build them out in the in the tertiary areas of oh, okay. the city and so again it's sort of like out of sight yeah some programs i've seen that are popping up now where 
they've built housing. This is really creative. They've taken train cars. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's have awesome. you seen this? Like and shipping containers. I've shipping seen. containers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And made living That's environments awesome. at these micro units. Yeah, yeah. Built 50 unit sort of village area where they could have a place to live. And it's actually done really nicely. I was like, my gosh, this is a train car. Where did like you it, see that? Then? I, I, it's been a while. I thought uh, I thought I saw one in San Diego, but I can't okay. remember. But I, I, you can look them up yeah, and see this. Awesome. But yeah. where these people have done that, cities have said, "Here, I'm going to set aside this area," and they build this area. Mm. They, they contract with a private developer and they they put these together. And like, it's a thriving place, and they have a home, and they have a community, and they can like do well. And I'm like. That's an interesting and unique way of doing something yeah, to, awesome. to have a community to live in. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So that's just, there's a multitude of ways I think we could probably slice the problem and figure it out. But yeah. we're not doing a very good job of yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would imagine a lot of those people who live in like awesome, you know, beachfront locations in LA and they have, you know, some fucking fucked up person right outside, they're probably right. not too happy about. So I'm sure they're, they're not. Yeah. They're not. And there's different laws that, that, that have, come around that are called the right to exist laws for really a better way and so for instance uh you could have where they that the person has the right to live on your doorstep practically Whoa. or live in front of your store wow. and and you're like well then that'll cut out my business no one's going to want to come by because they see this person who looks like they urinated on the side yeah. of the street there <laughs> and you're like what do i do with that i don't know I hate you know the the way where they title it right to live. Everyone has I think the right to live. Oh I, for sure, hundred percent. But again, we're not doing a good job at helping people out hmm. survive, understanding who has real problems and who has uh, a laziness problem. And again, yeah. I, I or drug addiction. I, there's a lot of things. Illness. We just need to fix it. Yeah, yeah. And we need to do a lot more. And we just want to push them away. And here, I'll give you money just to make them go away. Yeah, that's not the answer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's not. Yeah. Dang. Can we talk a little bit about your travels now? Sure. Sure. Um, so where, what are like the, the most, your most favorite trips that you've done? I, I tell you, a friend of mine had uh, scheduled a, a trip to India, which was really kind of my favorite. Um, dear friend of mine, since I was nine years old, her husband nice. was the former U.S. ambassador to India. Holy hell. Uh, and, and Wait, How long ago was this? This was uh, 2012, I guess. Okay. And so uh, her husband was governor of Ohio at one time. At the same time, Bill Clinton was governor wow. of Arkansas. And so they were friends. And so really? part of that was probably because of the relationship he got appointed to that. But they said, hey, we're going to do a guided trip to India. And do you want to go? And I'm like, well, you know, India, India was on my list. It was a lot further down. Hmm. But for you to offer to give a guided tour, I'm like, yeah, I'll yeah. do that. So... She works for a group that provides water to remote areas of the world, and oh, wow. they do that in India. And part of the trip was a donation to help one of these centers. They were opening it up. In fact, we went to go see the center in the middle of nowhere, hmm. and uh, we have our plaque, our name on a plaque, really? and part of that because we were all part of the the uh, setting up of this uh, remote location. Hmm. But nevertheless, we went on Christmas Eve, went out wow. and, and flew into Delhi. And I had we had a night or two uh, on our own before the rest of the group got there, and it ended up being like a sixty-person group that came. Oh with wow! This. Holy hell! And got to see everything from remote areas of the country mm. to high tea with the Maharaja of Jodhpur to wow. uh, everything in between. You know, people in the bush that live literally in huts. And wow. seeing them and, and watching how they exist to, like I said, having dinner in a palace with uh, um, the Dollywood or, or Bollywood rather stars. Oh, Bollywood. Yeah. yeah. It was most amazing. It was really an adventure. I'd hardly say it was a vacation because I came yeah. back and was still tired. But wow, what an amazing trip to, mm. to see ultra rich and the ultra poor yeah. and very little middle class, which is growing, but an amazing country, but but very polluted. Really? Um, I remember getting out and the day before we went to go see the Taj Mahal, we had dinner with some friends that were on the trip and I get out to visit them at their hotel. We were going to eat there and I get out and like, there's just smoke and like you can see as if you were at a campfire and wow. I go to the guy at the door and I said, 
I said, is there a fire nearby? And he's like, no. I said, but there's all the smoke in there. Oh, that's our fog. I'm like, no. Oh, my God. That's not fog. And I said, by the way, if you breathe this in every day, you're going to die early. And the kid looked at me like... You know, it probably wasn't a good thing to say, but oh my, just like pollution from literally, fires and yeah, smoke. Yeah, because and that's how people in the bush and uh, they're yeah. there. That's how they live. You know, by, mm. by by having fire. We get inside the hotel, and the hotel still had some of that air in there. Wow. You, you figure you go in the hotel, there's all this air cleaning. Yeah. It was still a little trying to see through inside the hotel, and that was probably one of the best hotels in in the area. Wow. Yeah, so it was kind of interesting, but I'll tell you. Seeing and the people are, are wonderful, very mm. hospitable. Um, but there's at least where I went, all there was was Indian food, and I love Indian food. Yeah. But two and a half weeks of Indian food, you're ready for something else. And so it was funny about halfway through the trip, we were coming back through Mumbai, and I remember seeing a uh, little Domino's pizza no way. kiosk. Oh and, my and I'm God. not a big fan of Domino's pizza at all, but I was like. I can't wait. I had Domino's Pizza. I said, this is the best food I've had in a long time. That's so um, hilarious. So it was hilarious. But uh, uh, all in all, it was a great trip. And um, the our, our host, my friend, and her husband, wonderful people, so down to earth. Mm. And the whole group was was just amazing. I mean, we had some Hollywood producers with us and some wow. stars from a couple different movie shows. And all wonderful, down to earth fun engaging people it was a great trip that's yeah, awesome that, that's probably my best adventure i've been to you know ireland and scotland and amsterdam was my last trip and that was interesting when did you go to amsterdam uh two two years ago okay. i guess it was how and was that it was beautiful yeah. it was really the architecture because i love european architecture mm. so much of that around i was greatly impressed of course there's always that red light district everyone yeah, wants yeah. to go see this so it's sort of the center of towns. So you can't. Really? You always kind of end up sort of going back through it. Um, it was interesting. Really, uh, it's just like windows, right? And they have yeah, like windows girls standing in the windows. and you know these these women standing in there, and I was like really turned off. It really? was kind of like a Clockwork Orange where they were oh, teaching the guy to you know you know they kept his eyes open and all he would watch is porn, and finally he was like <laughs> I, I just I can't see this anymore, and you sort of get you got really turned off. Yeah, you know, like it was seedy a little bit. Very, very seedy. Hmm. But it was odd. It was seedy, yet so much is going on. There's bars and there's all kinds of stuff going yeah, on yeah. that weren't necessarily seedy. Hmm. So it was just this intermix with that. Um, of course, there's marijuana everywhere. You yeah. have a little kiosk. And you see, you're, you're just walking along or biking along and boom, you go through this cloud of marijuana and you're like, oh well, I'm getting stoned just being yeah. here, you know? Um, but beautiful country, and the and we took the train to Rotterdam, and then we took a train out to um, Belgium, hmm. and loved Belgium, and out into Bruges. I don't know if you ever seen the movie In Bruges. No. Great movie, and yeah. I always vowed when I saw that that I got to go see that, and it was amazing, wow. so charming and beautiful. And I think there's so much world to see that I'd always say I wasn't going to go visit anywhere else. But that's a country I would definitely go back to really? see. Belgium and, and, and Bruges. Absolutely spectacularly beautiful, charming, amazing. Would you ever consider living outside of the U.S.? Uh, I would. I think I would need to understand the political and economic uh, conditions of another country because we always feel so safe here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's a whole different world outside. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it gets a little scary, but nevertheless, you know... Um, Canada, even I, we went to Montreal and Quebec. Yeah. Loved it there, but um, very possibly. You know. So when you come back here from these trips, does that really like put things in perspective as far as like like making you realize like what this country is or what what stands out about this country that you really appreciate and like? And... Yes. In fact, when I went to Scotland and Ireland, all they could talk about was Trump, which was running for really? election at the time, was Trump. They and, loved him. And Brangelina. Oh, Brad my and Angelina. God. What the so fuck? That was the two. Everyone wouldn't talk about that. Like, we know all about that. I wow. said, believe me. I said, we're a little embarrassed uh, about Trump. I said, there's a lot of things he's seemingly doing well from the mm. business standpoint. Yeah, I said, yeah. I just wish he would just not open his mouth in the way he does uh, so many times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was just funny to, to hear how people's perspective are of hmm. the United States. Yeah, and yeah. In fact, you look, a lot of the best news comes from like the BBC and you yeah, look at oh, yeah. some of those sources and you watch your own news about your country and see their take on it and it's a whole different perspective. Wow. Yeah. So one, one, one other thing I want to ask you, um, as this goes with the news thing, 
do you do you how do you get your news do you follow like different networks or because this is something people talk about so much lately because they're like right if you watch this they're biased if you watch that they're biased so do you how do you do that? well so i try to i, I get it from uh, some different spaces I, some of it's just a twitter news feed yeah. or i get a i think it's called a top five from cnn and okay. i get an email to me and then there's other stories that come from that um so i look at that wall street journal hmm. that's my biggest sources of news i i don't watch tv i only have streaming really okay and i watch like hulu and a few things like that so if i get it typically online and okay. follow those uh those news sources and you kind of sift through it yourself and try and figure out what what's really yeah. there or not but i'm i'm like i said the bbc and that you can get through a twitter and instagram yeah. feed interesting takes on those and i love reading harvard business journal that's that's really some great great stories and leadership articles that i read mm. a lot not so much news but it makes you think okay yeah. oh yeah that's cool yeah okay so one one last question i always like to ask people is like yeah is there what do you look forward like in the near future uh to as far as like technology is is concerned like is there anything that you see coming or have heard about that you're like oh man that well i just came back from a conference in san jose yeah, the right. internet of things yeah, conference yeah. The internet of things world now, it was geared more towards kind of original equipment manufacturers who then take these pieces of equipment and, and, and make business models, make things that they can do. Okay. But one of the things you're talking about is that complete automation of things. And I alluded to it earlier where we have some of it now, but where you walk into your home again and it reads what's in your refrigerator, knows what inventory of everything you have, and you set your menu, and it'll either order from the places you, you'd like, or it will order all the food, bring it to you, and you can then cook it and do whatever you want. Mm. And everything is connected, but what concerns me the most is what we give up in privacy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Big brother George Orwell is now yeah. ever-present as it ever was. Everything is connected. I mean, even I have a Vivant alarm system, and if you get other people that have that... If you had something happen, you can say, hey, there's this thing called Streetwise, which connects all these systems. And so oh my if God. they were driving off of your property, then they went by their camera and their camera, you can kind of see what was happening. And so you think of this wow. web of connectedness that is exciting because you can get anything and everything you want yeah, yeah. in that middle of the brownie, right? Yeah. But what do we give up? We're being watched everywhere. Face recognition. Mm. Some places have said, "I can't. We're not going to do face recognition anymore officially." Yeah, yeah. But it's out there. Uh, you think about the technology in my business. If I want to know that who has seen my my apartments, if I had face recognition, as soon as they walk in the door, I could say, "Ah, oh, hi, Mrs. Smith. How are you? Yeah. So, how do you like living in Rochester?" Can you imagine that? That's so creepy. And you would like to do that because you want to know what they want. You yeah, can yeah. see here's all the things they have in their house. And their sofa is a seven-foot sofa. It won't fit in my floor plan 1A, but it will 1B. So I'm going to show you a 1B unless, or, or unless you're planning on changing your furniture. Wow. Can you imagine if you had that? In some sense, you'd say, oh, my God, they'll, then I'll, they'll take use of my time and whittle to the most important things. Hmm. But what do I have to know in order to be able to whittle that down to just yeah. what you want? I got to know everything about you. Is that good? I don't sure. know. Would you ever be interested in any, I think I asked you this when we were just talking, like any technologies, because they talk about now, like the future is going to be like technologies that are going to start to implant. Like, would you personally be interested? In chips and Whether it's like in your like hand, that. like in Sweden, I read recently, they're starting to do chip implants in your hand just to right. do like simple like payment things and like access into your building or whatever. I personally wouldn't. Yeah. That's just yeah, yeah. too much. Too I creepy. mean, we have it with our phones and everything else, with yeah, Apple yeah. Pay and all that stuff. And just being in the vicinity, it reads your IP address. And you, you could be read with a lot of different things. So hmm. you kind of already have that. Why do I need that as part of my biology? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe in my next generation. I don't know. Maybe when I get reincarnated. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Yeah. Not me. <laughs> wow. How old do you think you're going to live till? Do you have like do you, do you hope that? Well, my birth certificate has an expiration date. On what? It. <laughs> uh, do you hope though that technology like you'll be able to live like into your hundreds? Do you think? You know, there's a part if if the quality of my life would be good, I'd yeah, be yeah. interested. But if the quality of my life would, I, I don't want to live that long. It, yeah, I would live. I want to live well, and as long as I can with a good quality of life, meaning that I'm mobile, I can speak well, I can remember things. I'm not 
living off of all kinds of devices that are plugged into me in order yeah. to make that life exist well i'd Oof. like to do it as naturally as possible so that makes sense i'm not sure where that is yeah you know, maybe 85 or 90 yeah you know but again it has to be quality of life yeah that's beautiful all right hell yeah well thank you for doing this yeah. i appreciate it it's super it's great fun yeah man yeah we went a lot of places i wasn't sure we'd go to that's pretty cool this, yeah. the, you were right the hour like flies by right yeah man quickly. all right thanks michael awesome. brown thank yeah you. man all righty